Good afternoon and welcome to Nature's Returns, Investing in Ecosystem Services, a webinar series hosted by the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. My name is Corey Skalt and I will be your host for today's presentation. As many of you know, the Nature's Returns webinar series addresses the growing importance of ecosystem service valuation and investment. Each presentation is recorded and available from CBay through YouTube and on the Yale iTunes U channel. Today we are having a discussion about the importance of, and a method for, quantifying the impacts of landscape scale restoration projects. Specifically, we will learn ab about Restore the Earth Foundation's Ecometrics model, which is used to measure the value, in financial terms, of environmental, social, and economic outcomes produced by ecosystem restoration. This quantification supports the business case for cleaner air, cleaner water, and environmental resiliency. The webinar will focus on how proving impact in this manner allows more restoration to occur and enables better communication of the interconnectedness of environmental health and socioeconomic well-being. Joining us on today's webinar is Taylor Marshall. Taylor is the Director of Sustainable Programs at Restore the Earth Foundation, and she has dedicated her professional life to identifying and promoting solutions to environmental issues nationally and internationally. Prior to joining Restore the Earth, Taylor was with the Water Institute of the Gulf in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where she applied her expertise in integrated water resource management to develop and promote community-based approaches to protecting and restoring the Gulf Coast from storm risk and land loss. She also, she also focused on enhancing community resilience to such risks. Previously, Taylor served as Director of Operations at the Latin American and Caribbean Council on Renewable Energy and as Program Director with American Council on Renewable Energy in Washington, D.C. Taylor earned a Master of Science degree in Integrated Water Resource Management from McGill University. Now, finally, before we get started, I'd like to remind our listeners that there will be 15 minutes for Q&A at the end of the session. We encourage your questions. You can type yours in the Q&A section of your screen throughout the presentation, and I'll direct them, uh, I'll collect them and present them to Taylor at the end of the program. Now I'd like to pass things off to Taylor to tell us about the Ecometrics model. Taylor? Thank you, Corey, and thank you, Corey and Olivia, for having me today. Uh, appreciate being here and presenting to you all on our Ecometrics model and Restore the Earth's work in unlocking the business case for environmental restoration. Um, just as a little background, I'll tell you how Restore the Earth came to be and kind of our trajectory that led us to um, our current mission to restore a million acres in North America's Amazon, which brought us to the Ecometrics model and our deployment of it in our restoration efforts. Restore the Earth was created in 2008, um, born out of disasters from Hurricane Katrina and Rita, and then revving up our work after the BP oil spill in 2010. It was founded by two business savvy professionals out of retirement actually, who wanted to do good um, in their later years, but also provide their business expertise to getting meaningful restoration on the ground in critical areas. To date, we have restored over 50,000 acres along the Gulf Coast. Restore the Earth has raised $36 million in public and private investment to accomplish those restoration goals. And with that, we have also engaged over 30,000 volunteers in the process. And our mission overall through all of this is to restore the Earth's essential ecosystems and environments. So our focus, as I mentioned, is in North America's Amazon. And for those of you who are not familiar with this area on the map, this is the Mississippi River Basin. It actually is the third largest watershed in the world. And it spans two Canadian provinces and 31 states in the United States. All the tributaries, rivers, and outflow represented on this map actually represent 60% of the fresh water that flows out of the mouth of the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico. And this area also represents, understandably, millions of people and billions of dollars in industry, infrastructure, assets, and movement up and down the river and the tributaries. So from an economic and social perspective, it has a huge impact, but then also from an environmental perspective, it truly does function as an ecosystem similar to the Amazon, and it is the heart and lungs of North America. And so we focused on this area, not only because it's an essential ecosystem, but also because there's a dire need for restoration. 
And this million acres that we're focusing on is actually represented in that light blue area um, at the bottom of the map near the meth of the Mississippi. And the reason why we focused on this area is it's actually one of the most challenged areas in the watershed. It's the most ecologically degraded region in North America, which is surprising. And a lot of people don't like to acknowledge that because it's right in our backyard. But it also happens to span the largest concentration of underserved communities in the United States as well. In the 1970s, there's about 24 million acres of forest in this area, and today only 5 million acres remain. So there's about 80% of forest and wetlands that have disappeared. And for those of you who may not be familiar with what's happening on the Gulf Coast of Louisiana, the mouth of Mississippi, there's actually extreme land loss issues that we're facing um, through a series of problems such as sea level rise and subsidence. The state of Louisiana on its coast is losing about a football field every 30 minutes of land um, along the coast, which is obviously very extreme and critical. So that's why we are focusing in Louisiana and moving up the Mississippi River in our Million Acre Initiative over the next 15 years. So through Restore the Earth's work since 2008, one of our longest standing partners has been uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and they actually were the ones that brought this Million Acre opportunity to us. They've actually identified about 12 million acres that need to be restored, but they've identified the first million as kind of the tipping point. Once this million acres is restored, it will reduce America's carbon footprint by 2%. It will start reversing the hypoxia dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico by 12%. And over the lifetime of the project, it will uh, generate an integrated value of about $12 billion based on all the interest, assets, and infrastructures along, those, um, along the Mississippi River and the Gulf Coast, but also in the communities and the economies that are represented in that light blue area on the map. So once restored, this will understandably have a big impact, not just locally and nationally, but globally. And so when we were faced with this extreme challenge, but also really exciting opportunity, we realized that we needed a lot of partners and a lot of money to be able to accomplish a restoration goal, a landscape restoration at this level. So how did we set out to accomplishment, accomplish this? And that's where the ecometrics model came into play. So understanding being um, founded by some business savvy um, founders, we realized that we really needed to provide the business case for restoration to unlock private money um, in landscape scale restoration. And so we looked all over to kind of see if there was a framework or methodology that already existed that could demonstrate the integrated value of environmental restoration and all the residual benefits to the local um, society, communities, and the local economy. But there wasn't anything that existed just yet. And so we kind of pieced things together and created the ecometrics model. And it has allowed us to not only unlock the business case, but also capture the value created by restoration. And it maximizes every dollar that's invested from private funders and helps monetize the full value of the project's environmental, sorry, environmental, social, and economic impacts in a fully documented, verified way that is ready for, for audit and third party verified. So this is the model, um, very simple, broad brush um, overlay, but basically there's two functions, which I will describe. Um, first, let me start by explaining what frameworks and methodologies we incorporated into this model. So as I mentioned, we looked all over the world to kind of see what existed, assuming that there was already something in play, and there wasn't. But there are definitely pieces and puzzle pieces that we found and we could put together. So our model is actually aligned with four existing frameworks. The first is Social Value International's framework, or SVI. And it's an accepted international methodology and protocol that provides assurance of the value of social impact for specific restoration projects. The second is the International Integrated Reporting Council's framework, the IIRC which is a global coalition of regulators, investors, companies, standard setters, and accounting professionals who created this framework 
to focus on the international standard that could account for the tangible and intangible value creation over time of projects and, and add the reporting component to, to report out to funders or investors or stakeholders. The third is the American Carbon Registry, ACR, which is the accepted methodology, protocol, and standard to provide assurance of the value of the greenhouse gas offsets created, as well as some of the other offsets and credits that environmental restoration projects provide. And then finally is the International Finance Corporation, IFC's performance standards for environment and social sustainability. So we kind of took pieces from all of those frameworks and incorporate them into our model to the ecometrics model and that's what you see here and so paired with these frameworks and methodologies we also include a revolving fund in the restoration work that we do when we engage private companies so for every dollar investment invested in restore the earth for restoration we can actually unlock three dollars in public funding so this not only allows us to amplify the investment that's made, but it also allows us to amplify the number of acres that's restored. So through that revolving fund mechanism, we're able to scale three times. And then when you plug the restoration baseline plus what happens once the restoration is underway and the ecosystem services start to be created and enhanced, is you get a report out of 168 million in social, economic, and environmental return, which are represented within the six capitals, which you see there around that blue circle. And the six capitals are part of the market and non-market value that's created by environmental restoration. And that can be found in financial, social and relationship, manufactured, human, intellectual, and natural capital. And they're broken down there around the circle, as you can see. So this really brings together the best international frameworks and protocols, allows us to leverage money. So we're able to take that $1 and access three. But also through the model, we've been able to demonstrate that $1 in private investment can unlock between $9 and $15 in social, environmental, and economic return. And this has been truly compelling for our corporate funders because it provides them with a report out and a tool to not only demonstrate the return on investment in financial terms, which speaks the language of everyone from the sustainability officer to the CFO to the CEO, but it also allows them to see that return and rationalize larger investment in restoration because of the social and economic benefits that can be seen through the reporting that we provide. And so this has been kind of our keystone or Rosetta Stone, if you will, to be able to not only speak the language to multiple departments within these corporations that have interest in assets in this million acre region, but it also allows them to report out on the benefits that they're creating by investing in just environmental restoration. So de demonstrating this value truly demonstrates impact and it rationalized that bigger investment. So this is all very exciting. This chart is very pretty. It's pretty simple to understand, but you know, where do you start and how do you ground proof this and bring these collaborative partners to the table so that they can really start seeing this return and unlocking that investment. And that brings us to the beginning of our million acre journey, which is in Point Shen, Louisiana. It is about an hour and a half um, south of New Orleans. And it is our pilot project, which we have initiated. Uh, we broke ground in October. And it is a 4,000 acre ball cypress forest restoration project. And this has been brought to us um, by our partners at Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. And we figured that given our history and our track record on the Gulf Coast, it was appropriate to start here. But this landmass um, highlighted in blue here is actually one of the last major lines of defense protecting um, over 200,000 people from open water, um, as described with the land loss issues that we're facing here in Louisiana. And it's also owned and managed by the state. So this is our pilot um, integrating our ecometrics model into restoration on the ground with a variety of corporate partners who are interested in the model and its applications and want to see the report out so that they can scale with us and move up the Mississippi River um, in helping us restore the million acres. 
So just a quick snapshot, um, this area is extremely critical and actually is a perfect starting point for the Ecometrics model because it truly is at the forefront and the confluence of all of these social, economic, and natural-based issues. Um, from recreational and commercial fishing interests, um, it represents a huge area um, of it as an economic driver. Um, this area also supports the number one nursery for all the marine species in the Caribbean basin along the Louisiana portion of the Gulf Coast. Um, this project is actually directly adjacent to two uh, native tribes, um, one of which has actually been listed. Um, they did a big report in the New York Times. It's one of the first climate refugees in the United States. Um, also, this area represents 20% of the U.S. commercial fish catch. Um, as I mentioned, the population that it protects, over 200,000 people. Um, and then, as I mentioned, this is on state property, and this is a wildlife management refuge, which is actually one of the most heavily utilized in the state. And then from an ecosystem services standpoint, it also is the number one winter habitat for migratory birds. So very compelling, lots of um, interest, both economically, socially, and environmentally to protect. So the project is very simple. Uh, we don't need to nerd out too much on this, but it's basically to restore a historic bald cypress forest. Um, and once restored, this forest will actually provide a buffer and a storm surge protection to the low-lying communities in coastal Louisiana. So it'll enhance their resilience and protection, but also restore critical habitat to provide that recreational and commercial activity, but it also improve water quality and quantity and trap and capture CO2. Um, it will also create jobs and support a variety of economic activities and opportunities um, that Louisiana is famous for as a sportsman paradise. But looking kind of a step higher beyond the environmental piece, a lot of our corporate partners that are joining us in this venture are mostly interested in the other ecosystem service benefits that this provides to their operations and to their activities in the area. Um, there's the operational efficiency that projects like these, these green infrastructure, natural infrastructure type projects provide, which is operational efficiency, um, protection for their hard infrastructure and assets, um, the risk mitigation component, there's also the CSR and reputation component that this provides, being taking an active interest and investment in um, issues facing the local communities where their employees live and work. And then obviously the regulatory piece, um, this provides them with the ability to generate tradable credits and water quality, quantity, and carbon. Um, and this is increasingly of interest, especially for our national and international companies um, who have already adopted internal cost of carbon into their operations and strategy and planning. So it's kind of a broad brush on why this project is significant and why we wanted to use it in launching our ecometrics model and start moving up the Mississippi River. And so you guys are probably wondering, how did we start bringing these partners all together to deploy it on this project? And we actually partnered with the U.S. Business Council for Sustainable Development back in June 2016. We realized that a number of the companies that we were talking to were members of the U.S. Business Council and had interest up and down the Mississippi River. And so we joined with the Business Council in a strategic alliance with the intention of creating a collaborative fund. And the idea was all of these companies were very interested in our model and our work and wanted to deploy green infrastructure restoration initiatives for a variety of different reasons, but you know, typical story, no one wanted to write the first check. So what we decided to do, because in our mind, this will not be accomplished, this million acres will not be accomplished without a dynamic collaborative group of partners, we figured why not start a collaborative fund to bring all of these partners together jointly, and some of them are unlikely partners, um, to jointly fund not just the Pornishem project, that first 4,000 acres, but also scale and grow with us as we move up the river. So we launched the Strategic Alliance in June 2016. Um, in three months, we raised a million dollars. And within six months of raising that money, we had a thousand acres in the ground planted. 
And right now we are currently um, working on phase two of the project, which is to fund and restore the next thousand acres. And so in our engagement with these partners and what really brought them to the table to finally write those checks was a couple things, is fivefold. So the first was the ability to engage in a high level public private partnership in a collaborative manner. The second was scale, so really bringing in the business-led, multiple stakeholder initiative at a large level, at a landscape scale, where not only could they meet some of their personal interests, but they're also scaling to provide protection and resiliency for the local communities and economies that they live and work. The accountability, which is provided, excuse me, which is provided through the ecometrics model. The multiplier effect, so the ability to leverage, for Restore the Earth to leverage this fund and multiply and be able to amplify the investment that they give. And then obviously the real-time progress and results that they see in this take action approach. And this has been exciting for them because the progress and results that we provide through our model and through a tangible project on the ground, shovel ready, is that it gives them a way to measure directly the ecosystem services using the Ecometrics model and allows them to enhance and continue to provide the business case for engagement with us, but also in these kinds of projects, more importantly. And this also allows them and us to ground truth the model and projects of this scale and allows us to replicate and build on this momentum so that we can reach that true landscape scale impact, but also reach that million acre goal. So there are beyond just that all those feel good kind of needs, there are benefits that have also been very compelling for them, but also very useful when they go back internally to the company to explain why they're involved in this collaborative fund and initiative. So the reporting, every year we provide our partners a report that is third party verified and fully auditable um, to the funder in proportion to what they invested as well as for the full project as a whole. Um, the multi multi-dimensional credits that we provide, as I mentioned, carbon, water, phosphorus, and nitrogen credit credits that they get, um, that they can account based on their investment. That amplified investment, unlocking $3 of public funding, and then also being able to demonstrate through the report out of the model of the nine to $15 in value created. And then the thought leadership, you know, being able to discuss the collaborative nature of this initiative, the innovative nature of this initiative using the Ecometrics model and a way to actually get action on the ground and take part in tangible projects instead of just talking about them. And thanks to our partners, as well as the U.S. Business Council and the momentum that we've been seeing with the Ecometrics model, we've been able to talk about this work and demonstrate this work on some pretty exciting platforms and channels and we're gaining a lot of momentum and it's pretty exciting to see the people that are coming to the table and interest. And then obviously the employee engagement. We really, Restore the Earth got our start within smaller CSR projects back in you know 2008, 2010, the corporate social responsibility projects. And no matter how big we get, even through this million dollar, or sorry, this million acre initiative, we will always include employee engagement opportunities because for us, it's not only fun to get employees in the mud, but also for the funders, it's extremely exciting because it's a way to connect the dots and truly get their employees and their senior leadership on the ground to understand the compelling nature of these projects, but also the communities and the environments that are impacted and benefited by this work. And then finally, um, related to the business or the US Business Council and our alliance alliance um, you know in a lot of the conversations we've had and conferences we've gone to and corporations you know they always identify things that are missing or that they're looking for and it's been really exciting pulling all these pieces together because we check all of these boxes through the collaborative fund and through our ecometrics model we have a pipeline of fundable projects we have a collaborative nature to our partnership and funding we can measure and account for the co-benefits. We have that multiplier effect, the progress and results in real time that we can account for, and a methodology and a framework that's scalable and replicable. And then a pilot that's shovel ready that is currently in process of restoration. So 
Um, so it's really been pulling all the pieces together, but this has led us to achieve that landscape scale restoration approach in a highly collaborative manner. So I'm gonna turn it, Corey, did you Great. wanna ask? Okay, yeah. go ahead. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, just wanted to step in for a moment for any of you who joined after the start of the program. Uh, we have Taylor Marshall on the program from Restore the Earth Foundation, and she just told us about the foundation's ecometrics model and integrated reporting for environmental restoration. Now she's going to tell us a little bit about employee engagement opportunities to engage those corporate funders as part of Restore the Earth Foundation's work. Please remember to enter any questions you have through the Q&A chat box in the webinar platform, and uh, I will pose those questions to Taylor in a few minutes when we enter the Q&A session of the webinar. Thanks, Taylor. Thank you, Corey. Um, so finally, I just wanted to end kind of on a more fun piece, which, as I mentioned before, is the employee engagement. Um, we have not only created long-standing relationships with new and old corporate funders through getting them in the mud, but also it's been a way to truly communicate and explain the social and economic importance of these projects on the ground. When you can see, touch and feel the restoration, but also get to interface and meet with the communities and the economies that will benefit from healthy and restored ecosystems. So just some fun highlights from past uh, employee engagement opportunities with REF and things that we'll continue to do. Um, we work and engage with our partners at, to create and co-create um, meaningful employee engagement opportunities. So whenever we get a new corporate funder, we always talk to them and understand, you know, if they're interested in getting employees in the mud and if, you know, and what that would look like, if it's a day, it's a half day and kind of what their priorities are. Um, and so that's true of the collaborative fund and the partners that we have at the table working in Pornisham. To date, as I mentioned, we uh, have engaged over 30,000 volunteers. Um, in the past, we have done two-day offshore events, um, such as one to commemorate Hurricane Katrina in 2015, the 10-year anniversary. Uh, we did that with Sitgo and over 20 volunteers, which was a lot of fun, but also very hot because it was in August. Um, we've also done week-long events organized by groups like In Good Company, which has brought people from Eileen Fisher, Timberland Pro, Seventh Generation, Cliff R and Shell. So definitely events that have um, a variety of volunteers from a variety of different companies. And then right now we're actually gearing up for an Earth Day event with one of our uh, funders, VMware, at their campuses um, in the US and abroad. So a lot of different opportunities, but just meaningful ways that we you know, kind of go to the next level with our corporate partners. So here are some fun pictures from our groundbreaking at Pointish End. This happened in October. Fun, muddy. It wasn't so hot because it was October, it wasn't August, but always a good time. So if you guys are interested, we're always open to some free labor. So if you're interested, definitely contact us and we can let you know the next time we're doing a project. Um, and then, as I've mentioned, kind of a running theme throughout all of this presentation is just that, A, this would not be possible to do this alone, that we need to all work together to achieve the restoration that's needed, not just in the United States, but across the world, but also the importance of bringing unlikely partners to the table. Obviously, this is a variety of companies and public agencies but for us it's been really important to bring these groups together and to figure out those commonalities or those common interests and be able to engage them in investing in meaningful projects but also having fun while doing it and we really wouldn't be here today and we wouldn't have the partners that we have today if it wasn't for our ecometrics model and our business our ability to unlock the business case and be able to speak in terms that each one of these entities can understand and that they could drive home internally to their different departments and different interests. So it's been a very exciting journey and we can't wait to add more logos to this page. And so with that, we're excited to get started. And just as a little preview, this is kind of where we're going next once we uh, move out of Louisiana. So a lot of work to do, but we're very excited about it. 
Great. Thank you so much, Taylor. Uh, really appreciate your presentation. As a reminder to all of our listeners, you can type questions in the Q&A section of your screen and I'll pose them to our guest. Uh, we've already had a lot come in, so let's get started with the first question. Uh, Taylor, we have one question uh, about the Ecometrics model. Uh, the, the quantification provided by the Ecometrics model seems to be very useful for public relations and allowing corporate funders to explain and report the benefits uh, of their investment. But what makes the model generate more investment than would otherwise occur? So, and I kind of touched on this a little, but essentially in being able to provide monetary terms to the return on this investment, it can really speak to all different departments within an organization. So depending on the organization, the funding streams that we see for a lot of these projects, you know, in the past has been CSR philanthropy, but using the business case, we're able to tap into operations dollars and marketing dollars. And a lot of times what we've had is we'll get a partner who's extremely interested on board and they will go inside the company and leverage their relationships and contacts within those different departments to really piece together meaningful or, you know, bigger pools of funding. But this allows the operations people to understand the benefit, whether it's from a green infrastructure standpoint or whether an economic return standpoint to unlock money from those budgets and in most cases pair it with philanthropy dollars or CSR dollars that come from other um, priorities and interests. But this really provides kind of a broad brush shot of all the different ways that a restoration project can meet different departments, initiatives, or priorities. Great. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, we had another viewer question asking about the technology used. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about the technology and analytics behind the Ecometrics model? Uh, and how do you achieve real-time reporting? So we, again, the power of partnerships, we uh, work with a couple different entities to collect baseline data. Uh, one of our partners is Terra Carbon, which helps collect the, the environmental baseline data. And then locally here, in, and it will be different for every project, but for the Pointershine project, we actually partner with the Water Institute of the Gulf, um, my former employer, um, to ca uh, calculate the social and economic baseline in the communities. And the framework for these baseline is all provided in those, um, the frameworks and methodologies that I mentioned prior, like Social Value International and the IRC. So we basically have built them into our model and that kind of provides the map for us in collecting the baseline, but then also tracking the metrics as the project is underway. And so another group that we're working with does remote, and I'm not a technical expert on this level, but does the remote sensing and kind of the big data collection through the lifetime of the project. So we're able to actually provide funders. We have a private dashboard for our funders to be able to see in real time the carbon that's been offset or the jobs that have been created. Obviously, some of those things take, you know, three to five years to quantify. But um, once the trees are in the ground, you know, they start, um, you know, biomass is produced and they start offsetting carbon. So we're at least able to, to process that. So a lot of different levels of technical ability through our partnerships. And again, I apologize. I, I'm not in the nitty gritty on those details, but um, but sure. we, well, it's been important for us to quantify those. Yeah, and it's clear that those collaborations are really key to making the model work. Mm -hmm. um, Taylor, how does the cost of your restoration projects compare uh, you know, on a per acre basis to other projects? Or alternatively, how do the credits that you generate uh, compare to other credits on a cost per credit basis? So understandably, our restoration is a little bit more expensive. Um, and part of that reason is actually the type of trees and plant materials that we use. Um, for example, with the Pointershem project, um, we are planting bald cypress trees. And instead of the standard um, bare root seedling trees that are used for, you know, landscape scale restoration grade plantings, we actually use a proprietary process that Restore the Earth um, owns called EcoGrown, which allows us to grow trees faster, but also so that they have larger root balls or root mass. So a tree, a one-year-old tree is about my height. I'm about 5'3". 
um, and the root mass is pretty significant. There's some more information on our website about this. But when we plant, because they're able to establish sooner and they're a lot hardier, our success rate is somewhere between 80 and 90 percent versus bald uh, bare root seedlings, which typically have you know a 40 to 30 percent success rate depending on the area. And this has been highly important, especially in Louisiana, where there's a lot of dynamic hydrological events, whether it's flooding or you know uh, big summer storms. So that obviously is a little more expensive. It's about $35 a tree. Obviously, those economies of scale change when you're doing you know, a thousand acre restoration, um, but it is a little more expensive, but then again, it is, is more successful. And then in terms of the credits generated, when working with the American Carbon Registry, we do work to, um, with them in providing the highest quality credits that they can account for and retire. And so, again, there's some more information on our website about that without getting too much in the details. But uh, we always want to make sure that the work that we're doing, the, what we're providing to our partners is at the highest quality and has the highest potential for success. So obviously, always going to be a little bit more expensive um, than traditional restoration methods that have been used in the past. Sure. Classic, uh, you get what you pay for. <laughs> um, could you talk to us about uh, the maintenance cost for ensuring that the benefits you create and the credits that you generate uh, last for a long time? Uh, you mentioned there's a lot of volunteer involvement, and is that the primary way that you fund maintenance activities over the years uh, subsequent to the initial restoration activity that takes place? Um, so in terms of the maintenance of the projects, um, so for example, with Pointishen, it is located on state managed land. And so once the project is complete, the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries will continue to monitor and manage the land as the full wildlife management area, including this project, just as part of their regular responsibilities. Um, they're also the ones that brought this project to us because of the dire need of restoration on the site. So, that's kind of that's already built into the project. There isn't really a need for additional management or maintenance in the future. So that's not something that um, is built into this because it's already already taken care of. And then looking at the million acres, um, that million acres is a mixture of public and private lands, but it's basically been identified by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And again, this will get. I could go on a tangent and get a little more in the details, but essentially once the land is restored, the plan is that a permanent conservation easement is placed on it and it is either going to be um, returned into a public entity or managed by the private entity that owns it. And so it's different for every patch of land, but there's a plan built into that so that we're making sure that you know, restore the earth doesn't have to keep coming back to manage it, but that it's part of the succession plan for whoever purchases the land or uh, once it's retired into conservation easement. Great, thanks. Um, some ecology questions that, that came <laughs> up. Uh, how are you planning for sea level rise and climate change impacts? Um, for example, are you working with trees that are saltwater tolerant or you know anything that's kind of projecting those changes that might take place absolutely i mean and that's why we're kind of focusing more i mean and this is specific to louisiana um focusing more inward is you know we want to make a we want to provide protection for these communities and provide green infrastructure attributes which will protect assets or infrastructure but we also want to make sure it's not in vain and so again this goes back to why our partnerships are so important to us is we work really closely with the parish and the state to identify the right projects so um, again in this example louisiana department of wildlife and fisheries is the manager they've been monitoring this site since they've you know, acquired it back in the 50s, I believe. And so they actually have seen the changes and saw that this, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, that this site was increasingly ready for rest, or, you know, that the conditions were ripe for restoration. But they also advise us on what is the best restoration. We're not the experts in that. So we rely heavily on the land managers at each site to work with us to let us know what's appropriate. So we don't, we're not just planting trees to plant trees, but we, 
you know, select the species. So in this case, this species is tolerant to the conditions that um, are at Pointish End. It's um, the bald cypress. So this area is a little bit fresher, but still has some salt water, but it's within a water management controlled unit. So we, we're ensured sustainability of those conditions through the state management of it. But also we contract with local nurseries. And in this case, there's a local nursery just around the bend from this project to collect native seeds and grow them at the nursery with our, our proprietary methods so that we can ensure that it um, you know, is used to the conditions and ready for it. And sorry, I'm kind of going off on a nerdy tangent, but in terms of climate change and sea level rise, this has been identified. Um, I mean, there's no promises, especially in today's landscape, but it's more inland and we want to make sure that it is there so that it protects the communities. Um, we also work within the parameters of the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan which is a state uh, initiative using the top tiered science and modeling to determine the best areas for restoration and protection. And this is complementary to that plan. So we're not just kind of going rogue and planting trees, but we're working really closely with state and local experts to make sure that um, it's appropriate for the landscape, but also can address a lot of the climate change projections that they are seeing and the risk in this area. Great, thanks. So unfortunately we only have like two minutes left, but we do have a lot of questions. So we're gonna to try to do a lightning <laughs> round and just throw oh, a God. couple at you and maybe get the, the very high level answers just to <laughs> give people a taste of, of the direction that you would go in. Um, one question that, that we've seen a couple of times is on the measurement of the return on invested dollar, uh, you know, the, the $169 million figure. Um, you, know, you explained how this is the combination of various aligned frameworks for measuring different values. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what modeling exactly you do, how the outputs are measured, just get a little, give us a little bit more of a taste for how you kind of come to that figure? Honestly, I, I can't in a lightning <laughs> round without going too in the yeah, weeds, but I would, I would recommend that um, everyone go to, and interested in that question, go to our website, restoretheearth.org. Um, and there's the area based the ecometrics model that will go into more detail. Great. Um, actually, connected to that, uh, we had a f many people asking, you know, how they could learn of more about the model and tool itself. Uh, uh, several people asked if it's an open source model or if it can be purchased for use by another organization, um, or if the annual performance report is publicly available. So, could you speak to that? And then I'm just going to tie in one other question. Um, you know, could this be applied to smaller scale restoration projects uh, if other, you know, especially if other organizations want to use it? Uh, or is it kind of particularly connected to large scale restoration? Sorry for such a oh, no. question. <laughs> these, are all, these are all great questions. I'm glad so many people are interested. Um, so eventually this model will be open source. At the moment it is not because we want to get it up the ground running um, for our million acre work. Um, so I guess my pitch would be if you're interested join us work with us and you can have you know work with us in deploying the model in some restoration um, and then eventually we do want to make it publicly available to those interested in uh, you know quantifying the benefits of environmental restoration this model could actually be applied to small scale and large scale um, projects um, but at the moment like I said uh, restore the earth is just focused on our initiative, but always eager to talk to people who are interested in this work or who want to learn more. So I definitely welcome people to contact me if they want to see if their projects or interests might align with ours and we can maybe work together. And with that, I'd also just do a very shameless plug. I'm getting a text from my associate um, for our social media and for our, our Twitter handles. So definitely check us out on Facebook. Restore the Earth Foundation, as well as Twitter at ref underscore restores. Um, but if you check out our website and kind of keep tabs on us, you'll definitely see where we go on this journey and always eager to connect with people who are doing work in this space. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Taylor. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, we would like to give a big thank you to our guest, Taylor Marshall of Restore the Earth Foundation for a wonderful discussion. The recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube and iTunes U channel, so please check back for those soon. 
Last but not least, be sure to check out the Yale Center for Business and the Environment website and newsletter for more information on upcoming webinars. My co-host, Olivia Sanchez-Bedini, and I would like to thank you for joining us for this webinar. Have a great day.